Good evening everyone and thanks for joining us tonight for our um, Zoom webinar uh, Across Five Decades with Richard Bennett. I'd first like to introduce you to our MC for the night, Bruce Gould. And uh, for those of you that don't know Bruce, um, I'm sure you've seen him around the club. He's been a member of the squadron for 47 years, joining us in, in 1973. I think he's probably been on every, every committee that's, that's possible there. He's been on general committee. Um, he still is on our assets and, and maintenance committee and he is the driving force be behind um, keeping that, that waterfront area um, in, sh in top shape for us to go sailing. But uh, Bruce's credentials to help us uh, with Richard tonight really come from his sailing. You know, he has also done 46 Hobarts, um, been a winner in two Admirals Cup and um, also been in the America's Cup. Um, so, you know, he's got a wealth of sailing experience under his belt as well. And I'd like to thank Bruce and Richard for joining us tonight. And I'm going to hand over to Bruce now. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Richard Bennett, RIM, uh, who is going to be our key talker at this webinar. Richard's images are synonymous with the Sydney Hobart race. He has photographed every race since 1974. Uh, he's, I, he's done as many, he's almost done as many photographing uh, races as I have in the, the race itself. I started in 1963, so there you go, Richard. And in, 19, uh, and in 1999, he won the Nikon Kodak Australia Press Photographer of the Year Award for the best sports photograph with his images of the 1998 Sydney Hobart race tragedy. In 2006, he was awarded the Photo Imaging Council of Australia's highest award, the Gold Tripod. And Richard has written numerous books, both on uh, sailing and on, on uh, uh, food books, uh, and also on um, the wild west of Tasmania. Uh, and tonight, he is going to talk about his latest book, Across Five uh, Decades. So welcome aboard, Richard. Uh, Bruce, thank you uh, for your kind introduction and invitation. And uh, good evening, uh, ladies and, and gentlemen. The 75th Sydney Hobart, I believe, was a catalyst for uh, a lot of yachtsmen and, and women to get ready for uh, this uh, great race. And uh, I have been looking forward to that. And it was also a catalyst to me to put together a new book of images covering my five decades photographing the race. It was based uh, on an exhibition uh, that I had at the um, uh, Maritime Museum of Tasmania um, uh, two years ago. And I decided to make uh, an archival book on fine art photographic paper in a large format featuring the work I've done and my favorite images over the past uh, 46 years. You're looking at the cover, it's in a box and um, the book is limited to uh, an edition of, um, I decided 170 copies, uh, which was the number of entries uh, that I understood had, had uh, registered an interest to enter the race. The book was edited by uh, Sydney journalist um, Mark, Mark Whitaker. My daughter Alice flies with me from time to time and and back in the 1990s, uh, she, um, I trained her and she helped me photograph uh, several of the Sydney Hobarts. And she, she shot this photograph of her old man um, a couple of years ago. Now, I photographed initially in 1974. I went out and photographed a few boats and I decided that I would like to come back in 1975 and photograph the whole fleet. And it was very fortunate 
that uh, in 1975, um, Kailoa was in the race and Winwood Passage. And um, Kailoa broke the race record of two days, 14 hours, 36 minutes and 56 seconds. And it was an amazing race. And um, when I found her on the East Coast with Winwood Passage close behind, it was the first time I'd ever seen such an amazing large yacht. She was on the plane at 23 knots and photographing from above, I looked down and decided to use backlight and to feature the uh, shadows in the water. And when I got to the dock in Hobart, hoping to sell a couple of photographs of this boat, the crew came along and um, they were very complimentary and they ordered more photographs than I possibly could have imagined. And so I decided that from that year, I was going to photograph every boat in the fleet and I would photograph them under different conditions and from different angles. I'd make a portrait of each boat make it as photogenic as I could, because I love photography, I loved aviation, loved the sea, and this was the perfect creative expression for me. And so that's how it all began. And uh, so I kept on, and this was Windward Passage, who, uh, was close behind Kailoa, but a wind shift that she didn't pick up soon enough caught her by surprise and she had to turn tail and lost 20 minutes, which made the difference between winning. And here we have Apollo in 1975, again photographed from above, because at that stage I didn't have a pilot with a low level endorsement. But in 1978, I'd had discussions with Nick Tanner, who was a pilot at Taz Air, and I explained to Nick what I wanted, and he was able to put me in the position I wanted to be irrespective. And that position was low down. And when I was close to the water, I could include the sky. And the sky meant that I could explain the weather. It meant I had a background. It also meant that I could make seascapes and include beautiful coastlines. In addition to that, it enabled me to use the wake of the boat and the water as a compositional element to explain the sea state. And I absolutely loved it. I, I couldn't wait. While most people define their year by Christmas, my year was defined by the Sydney Hobart Yacht Race. In 1979, there was a great circle yacht race. And this is Roly Tasker's Siska. We flew round to the south coast looking for Siska. And uh, we flew into a gale and the front came through and uh, the sky was stormy and inky black and we could hardly see a thing. And I was ready to turn around and I said to my pilot, are you, are you okay with this? And he said, yeah, I can see the water. Well, this is a front. Give us 10 minutes, we'll come out the other side, which we did. But we couldn't see any boats. And so we went into Coxbite Beach and we landed for 20 minutes. We had a cup of tea with some bushwalkers <laughs> and then took off with this northwesterly gale coming down over the beach. And uh, we climbed, banked out to sea, and there was this white cap that was bigger than all the others, and it was Cisco under storm sails, really going like a train. 
you can see a mutton bird off the jib and you can see another one right in front of the camera. Oh, yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. And so every year I, I went out, but I was always photographing from Hobart. I was always expecting the fleet to turn up and you know, it didn't always turn up, did it? We know that. But this is uh, Margaret Rintoul in um, one of my favorite locations, right on the end of Tasman Island. And I've spent many hours every year off Tasman Island. Now these are the spread pages from my book. This, this is um, a PDF of the actual artwork for the book. On the left is Sid Fisher's Ragamuffin in 1970. Um, I've placed her here in the shadow um, to contrast uh, with the sails. And uh, the year before, Ragamuffin had won the Admiral's Cup, which included that infamous fast net race in which 15 sailors and three rescuers were killed. That's Hitchhiker on the, on the right hand side. There was a romance about this boat. She tended, I noticed, to roll from side to side. And I remember that the Tasmanian yachtsman Charles Blundell, Chaz from Taz, was on board and he became one of uh, Tasmania's um, yachting greats. This is Styx on the left, coming around Tasman Island. Now in a fresh northeasterly, there's a now famous gust of wind, which howls down from the high cliffs. And uh, it comes down onto the water and often catches boats a little bit unawares. I've seen uh, two boats dismasted here as a result. But here during this 82 Hobart, Sticks, uh, skippered by Joe Abraham, was on the receiving end and I was there to capture the image. 30 seconds later, the mast was uh, parallel with the water. I stay out there till the end of the day and I love the very late afternoon light. And here I photographed uh, Sunseeker. And I'm not just about photographing the boat, but I want to explain the effect the boat has on the sea, the wake and the sea state. And I really enjoyed the, the waves behind the boat. Here we have Vengeance in uh, 1983, skipped, uh, skippered by Daily, David Kellett rounding Tasman. I was on board that year, mate. Were you, Bruce? I was there. Yeah. Well, Vengeance had taken line on us in 1981. And here, she, she took my breath away because I couldn't see her there till I came round the corner and she was tucked right in close to the island. I think there's a little bit of current runs there, Bruce, close in. There was. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. And um, the Friday was used by, I think, TAA the following year, you know, promoting the Hobart race. Yes. Yeah, I think it was too. Yeah. That's indulgence on the right. And she broached in, I think, what was called a Chinese jibe where the upper section of the main went across the boat and filled while the lower section and boom remained on the other side. Mm. And this incident, in, incident and the resulting photographs were published around the world and they influenced the decision to measure the riding moment of Sydney Hobart yachts. They broke two titanium uh, spinnaker poles and one of, the, one of the crew commented, don't start the engine, I'm standing propeller. <laughs> the thing I like about this picture of Pilgrim is that it's very traditional. The crew are wearing um, they're wearing greasy wool jumpers. 
Today, we've got black hulls, black sails, black waterproofs. Yeah. But it's not that easy to photograph anymore, but this was very pictorial. And uh, I feel there's a bit of nostalgia about the, the picture and the way the guys are dressed. It's, uh, it's great. Well, for the audience, you, you can no, notice the big blooper behind the main. Uh, thank God we don't carry them anymore. <laughs> they caused a bit of bother, didn't they, Bruce? Yeah, they only set for about 10% of the time, and that was it. <laughs> right. Now, the thing about this picture is that this is 19... 84 and I'm waiting for the fleet to arrive and most of them didn't because there was a storm that knocked most of the fleet out which was very disappointing for me and I was waiting down at Tasman Island and I could see this amazing light coming through Tasman Passage with, uh, I think it's West Arthur Head in the background. And, but there wasn't a boat there. And I looked up the coast and I could see Shogun coming with that uh, red, blue and yellow spinning. And I thought, there's no way the light will hold for 20 minutes. An aircraft hire was expensive, but I decided to wait and we orbited on the spot for 20 minutes and the light held and Shogun sailed into the shop. And that image won the, um, the Ilford Trophy, the highest scoring image in the Australian Professional Photography Awards in 1985. Yeah, well done. But the thing that made a difference to me was not only uh, had I missed out on photographing a fleet, but I missed a storm in Bass Strait. And imagine what pictures would have been out there. But nobody had ever been out there to photograph storms in Bass Strait. And so I talked to my pilot about how to do that. And he had a twin engine all weather aero commander aircraft. So I decided that in 1985, I would charter that twin at great expense at the time. And I'd fly to Sydney and I would go looking for storms. And the next time there were some great pictures during the Sydney Hobart, I would be out there to capture them. And so that's what what I did. I went to Sydney and um, then I started photographing the fleet coming down the coast. This is uh, Lou Abraham's um, Challenge 3 off um, Wollongong. Um, mm. Lou was um, a regular visitor to my stall at uh, Constitution Dock. His address was 33 St. Ninian's Road, Brighton, 3186. I even remember his address because he ordered a photograph from me every year. And then on the following day, I'd go out in a Bass Strait or down the New South Wales coast and I'd be looking for wind. Stronger the better. And I found it. In 1985, Starlight Express, pocket maxi, bouncing out of the water, which was uh, extensively published. And I remember Ian, uh, Ian Trelevin, uh, he liked the picture. And um, Cascade uh, used that on their Cascade beer can. Each, each uh, Sydney Hobart, they deliver a couple of slabs to every boat as a welcome to Hobart. And for many years, they featured my photographs. 
And so for the first time, I was able to show people um, who were interested in sport what was happening with the race out, out at sea. But the thing that, that drove me was looking, looking for wild weather because that's where the action would be and that's where I'd find the great images which gave me the satisfaction and, and uh, it drove me to continue. And this is Firetel from uh, 1986. What I liked about this picture was it told the story, excuse me, just wandering around here. Um, there was only one man on deck and there's a huge wave coming, if you notice. And it looked to me like it was a very long way to Hobart. People don't realise that when you get out there for two or three days, the weather and the sea is unrelenting and it tests men and machines and equipment. And I think mentally, yachtsmen and women need to be really tough to drive a boat all the way from Sydney to Hobart. When you're cruising, you can go downwind, you can reduce sail, you can take it a bit easy, you can have a rest. But when you're racing, um, you don't have any respite from the elements. And uh, it's the elements that dictate the outcome often of human, human endeavor. Mm. 1990. Wow. Wow. Now this is a, a Melbourne Hobart boat, but I'd look at the weather and if it was blowing harder on the west coast than it was on the east coast, I'd go where the wind was blowing harder. I'd look at the location of the Sydney boats so that I didn't miss any. And if I had time, I'd go down the west coast. And this day at Matsaika, the wind was gusting to 50 knots. And we headed down there and it took a long time to get there in a Cessna with a 40 odd knot headwind. And in the distance, I saw this white cap that was bigger than the other white caps. And we headed towards it at a thousand feet. And I could see a boat planing, a lot of white water. And I went down, we went down there and it was wild thing. There's about 50 knots gusting. Wild thing, most of it was out of the water. And if, if you look on the, to the right of the screen, there's still a hole in the water all the way out of the shop. Mm. And uh, that was, and probably still is one of my most successful photographs. It was published on uh, the cover of just about every yachting magazine around the world. I produced a poster and sold it in 46 countries. And quite recently, Grant Warrington was in a, a round the world race. And one of the uh, yachting writers made the comment that this image established his reputation as an offshore yachtsman in a single photograph. Um, I think it's not a matter of luck getting good pictures. It's a matter of preparedness waiting for an opportunity. If you're out there looking all the time from daylight to dark, year in and year out, the good images do come up. But this is one of the most rewarding images that I've ever, ever produced from my point of view. And it's, it's been very well received. That's a great shot. But um, your patience to, you know, to actually crack one like that, I and mean, what, one second later and you haven't got it? Well, one second later it had come off the wave and it's starting to go down the other side. But there is a sequence. It'll go down the other side. It'll speed up as it goes down the other side of the wave and then it'll climb up onto the next crest and surf before it comes off again. So it's a matter of timing as well. 
Don't blink. <laughs> Don't blink. Uh, this is zero three. And um, by the 90s, we were starting to attract uh, a few international boats. And uh, Zero 03 was from Japan, photographed with a long lens heading for Tasman Island. And here we have the New Zealand boat, Ice Fire. She was right on Tasman. And uh, there was a big sea running at the time and I really enjoyed this picture because uh, you can see how tough it is for that crew on the rail and there are some big white caps there and uh, it really explained the sea state to me. I'm conscious of the time is going, we're nearly halfway through yeah, I take the time at the moment. This could go, it could go on and on and on with these pictures and the story. 1993. This boat, number 97, I think Andrew Strachan. And there was a big storm in 93 and only 38 boats, I believe, finished. And most of them, having a bad forecast, went out to sea. But 97 went west into Bass Strait. She came down the east coast of Tasmania inshore. And I went down to Tasman to find the leader, to photograph her coming around Tasman. I'm not sure whether you can see it was driving rain. And I get to Tasman and there's a 40 footer and I'm thinking, hang on, I've, I've missed the leader. But no, it was the leader. And one of the smallest boats, I believe, to take line on us. Because the bigger boats went out to sea and um, they were much slower in getting to Hobart. I think Michael Green was skippering the boat for um, Andrew Strachan. Yeah, okay. 94 was the 50th Sydney Hobart. And there, it was, I think it was the biggest yacht race in history. There were 372 entries. And I used six aeroplanes and helicopters. And with my daughter, Alice, who was 16, spent 56 hours in the air. Wow. And... Um, this is uh, Robert Clifford's uh, boat. He chartered from New Zealand. And uh, she's off the northeast coast of Tasmania. And uh, she took line on us in the great race. I remember, I remember one of the cartoons in the Sydney paper had a picture of Sydney Harbour with North Head in it on the left. It had South Head on the right, and down the coast it had the boat Tasmania. And the caption read, North Head, South Head, Bean Head. <laughs> it was, uh, he got a picture, he got a copy of it and put it in his office. Yeah, it was a great effort. He was a very determined uh, man, Robert Clifford, and the crew did a wonderful job in... Um, being the first to Hobart. He was the first Tasmanian to win the Hobart online, I think. Right. Yeah. Well, it was a great effort. It's happened since, I think, in um, 2018. Alive uh, was the overall winner, not the handicap winner. Mm. Mm. And in uh, 1979, a Tasmanian boat screw loose um, was that an overall winner too i believe bruce yes he was this is centerfold from the 94 race and apollo we were we were very very busy that year i think kodak was the sponsor and i produced a book 
of the race as well. One of my favourite all-time pictures is Fremantle Doctor from 1994. There it is. I love the picture. The, um, it's shot in Storm Bay and it's blowing hard southwesterly and freezing cold and the water is going right over the boat. You just see the crew in a silhouette with the wind taking the tops off the waves. I get a lot of satisfaction out of doing this. And um, this was, I think, 1996. It was a beautiful day in Sydney and the fleet are heading down the coast with their spinnakers up. And we looked down to the south, there was a southerly forecast, and we saw this roll cloud. Mm, spectacular. The uh, spinnakers disappear. And um, we flew under that in our 172. It was quite eerie flying into that. But there were some, some interesting pictures there. So I'm up there every year and I'm looking for the strongest breeze. And uh, 1998. Hmm. This is Winston Churchill. It was a beautiful sunny afternoon on Boxing Day. And the fleet are all heading south. We photographed the entire fleet, Alice and I. And the next morning, um, we'd moved down to Marimbula. Yeah. And uh, we called up for a weather forecast from an aeronautical forecast. And the forecast was for 40 knots of wind. And uh, my pilot, Ralph Schwertner, said to me, um, looks like you're going to have a good day. They're forecasting 40 knots. I can vouch it was more than 40. <laughs> now, forecasting 40 knots of wind. And we always want to know what's it going to do tomorrow. And he asked, and tomorrow? And the meteorologist said, uh, no change. He said, what do you mean no change? He said, it's going to be blowing 40 knots tomorrow. And Ralph said, if it's blowing 40 knots for 24 hours, that is going to make a pretty big sea. So we were looking forward and we decided that we would go out to the rum line at 9am. We'd be there at 9am. So at 9am, we went out to the rum line and um, we found Sayonara and she didn't have 40 knots of wind. She had maybe 30. And she was in the company of Brenda Bella. And it's expensive to charter an aircraft. So I said to Ralph, listen, let's go back to Marimbu to refuel. We haven't got 40 knots. We'll come back at one o'clock because I want the strongest breeze. So we went back to Marimula and refueled, and we put a waypoint in for this position. And we came back at one o'clock. But we didn't have 40 knots of wind at one o'clock. We, we had... Um, I'm just going to interrupt you for one second. Go Lin ahead. Lin Lindsay's Mays just put a question in. Brenda Bella lost her rig off National Park. So it wasn't Brenda Bella down there with um, 
uh, Sayonara, I don't know who it was, but it wasn't Brenda Bella because she, she lost her rig according to Lindsay and he was on board, so he'd know. She didn't lose her rig just after I photographed her at 1pm on the 27th then? Uh, I'm, I can't remember to be honest, but... Uh, I think it was just after 1pm. Oh, anyway. wait a minute, sorry, I'm misreading it. What he's saying, that Brenda Bell lost the marks in 1996, sorry mate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Keep going mate, I'm sorry, I just buggered the date up. No, 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 that's all right. So when we got out there, we couldn't really find the boats. We went to our waypoint and descended. And you could hardly see where the sky finished and the sea began. The wind was horrendous. <clears throat> and we dropped down and there's AFR. And um, it was amazing. It was amazing. The sea was being picked up in, in sheets. And I'm in the back of the Aero Command with the door off. And I didn't really see the, the grand scale of the whole thing because I'm concentrating on nailing these, these pictures. And my daughter Alice is changing film for me. But <clears throat> it was really pretty rough. It was really rough. And we went from one boat to the next. And um, here we've got uh, bobsled. And if I move in close to this picture, you'll notice bobsled here has full starboard rudder and she's just going sideways. She's being blown sideways. Amazing. Brings back a few memories, Richard, I can tell you. Yeah, I reckon. And um, there she is again, from a different angle. And it's, it's picking the sea up in sheets. The highest wind gust, I understand, was recorded at 92 knots that day. We're getting salt build up all over the front, all over the front of our aircraft. And, um, and then we come across um, um, Aspect. This is David Pescud. And the waves are getting bigger and bigger. And as we flew past after the shot, I looked back, I couldn't shoot it, but I saw her become airborne as she came out the other side of that wave. And in Hobart, um, well, he set up sailors with disabilities and his crew had dis in small letters, abilities in big letters, and he was teaching them to sail. <clears throat> and one of the crew didn't have any legs. And the media said to him, oh, it must have been dreadful out there without any legs. How did you manage? And he said, what well, fantastic. It lowered the center of gravity. <laughs> so that was a very positive uh, thing for him to say. But it got worse. This is um, um, secret men's business. By this stage, by this stage, the wind is, is just unbelievable. The whole sea's feather white. And I'm taking the pictures and then my, I had two professional pilots because we tend to wear them out and we try to keep them fresh. And they said, hey Richard, we're going back to Marimbula. We, we're out of here. That's it. So we climbed out and we're heading back to Marimbula. And um, I'm very stressed because I'd spent 14 years since 1984 looking for a storm and I'd found one and my pilots are taking me back to Marimbula. I don't blame them, Richard. 
No, no, I don't. But then when we were going back, suddenly we said, hey, um, there's going to be mayhem out here today. The, the sea's getting bigger. It's only two o'clock in the afternoon and there's a whole fleet of yachts sailing into this that wasn't forecast. There, there's a disaster unfolding here. And we went back to Marimbula and we landed and refueled the aircraft. And then Ralph's phone went, search and rescue. We've, con we've seconded your aircraft. Um, there's been a May Day and we want you to go and look. So we went straight back out. And uh, Alice and I were observers. And we were the first aircraft out there. And uh, <clears throat> stand aside fired an orange flare when they heard us coming. And um, I shot this image from 1,000 feet. We held station immediately above the boat. And uh, shortly afterwards, I believe the ABC helicopter arrived. And uh, then the um, rescue helicopter. And uh, I watched stand aside inflate a raft, an orange raft. And it broke it's painted and it went up on its side, it cartwheeled away and then disappeared up into the sky. And I thought, well, a raft, a life raft is not any under these conditions. And then the helicopter dropped a, uh, a line and two frogmen, and I believe they were young girls, one of them was, who recently started flying, came down into the water in wetsuits and um, stand aside inflated another raft and um, they were asked to get off the boat into the raft because the helicopter wanted to use the boat um, as a reference point and, and then they winched them up out of the water and just after they got off a, uh, a wave came and and hit stand aside and sent it planing up over the top of the sea. The cabin was broken away. And I think the wave in this picture was the highest wave ever measured at 146 feet. Yes. And it was measured with a radar altimeter. And the helicopter crews were keeping a lookout behind them uh, because they were fearful of being swamped by a wave. And, um, and Ralph was listening to the May days, identifying the boats and then getting them to switch off their, um, their emergency beacons so that he could identify them one at a time. And we spent eight hours out there. And um, uh, Kingara lost a man overboard just, just on dark. And um, we were on our way back to Marimbula and the search helicopter flew round and round and couldn't find the man in the sea and they were doing their last sweep and picked up his head in the water and they picked him out of the water and we thought this is amazing the search and rescue arrangements actually work they can get a man out of the water here and, and then sort of arrive 20 minutes later another May Day man overboard it was Glyn Charles, but they were so far out to sea that they weren't reachable. And we'd heard uh, earlier, um, not long after Stand Aside, uh, of Winston Churchill's May Day, when they, I think, um, sprung a plank, perhaps. And um, Yeah, we were not in good shape, I can tell you. No. We no. Were, well, by, I think the May Day went out about quarter to five, and we were... We were in the life rafts by six. She'd gone. Yeah. Well, terrible times. Unbelievable. 
Unbelievable. Gee there, I mean, you really captured just how bad the conditions were there, Richard. It's just, you know, you just can't believe how big the seas were. No, no. Richard, just while we're there, I mean, what were the flying conditions like? Because, I mean, you know, it was blowing, well, our speedometer stopped at 70 knots, but it was blowing more than that. And the seas were, you know, huge. Um, it must have been pretty, you must have got knocked around flying. Horrendous. Apparently, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't good. And so I continued photographing the, uh, the race. Um, this is wild thing on the left. I get up at 3.30 in the morning and um, I get out to the airport at 4.30 and we're in the air by five. And on this overcast morning, for no reason at all, this beautiful light turned the sea gold. Just for a minute. Makes it all worthwhile. Because I'm after pictorial photography as well as action. This is Ilbrook, the first, uh, I think, of the Volvo 60s. We're starting to get international boats and this became part of their, their program and that added uh, considerably to the fleet. I think a welcome, welcome addition. On the left is uh, Doctor Who from, from 2000. It's no accident that I've got Tasman and the Rowl in there. And um, I love that early morning light and ragamuffin on the right. We're up to 50 minutes. Um, we got another 10 just to go through till the 75th yeah, we go, we've got, um, I just had someone put a question in about the race there in, you know, in 98. I'll just read it to you. Yep. The key rescue was Peter Davidson on the rescue chopper. Yep. Was, was the tea bag who picked up the stand aside crew. Several of my, of my mates were on that boat in, from South Australia. And right. that's Mike, Mike O'Reilly. Yeah. 94 was another windy race. And, uh, sorry, 2004. And I was out in Bass Strait in the Aero Commander. And I got some really strong pictures. This is Maserati. Mm. And um, Struth. Ah, I was on that. You were on that? Yeah. How about that? You're a glutton for punishment, Bruce. Yeah. No, it just shows you I'm bloody mad. Well, I'm mad too. That makes two of us. But it, it's better than being normal. Yeah, <laughs> agreed. Yeah. Anyway, I got a great picture of love and war that year. Oh, yeah. yeah. And... Um, Love and War is a three times winner, 74, 78, and I think 2006. Yep. And um, Lindsay would have been on board probably, I don't know whether he was on board for all three of those, but. Uh, he was definitely, definitely there for the 2006. Well, I think he was on, on all three, I think. Yeah, I think he might have been, yeah, he does navigator. And um, we had a black sky. I absolutely love being out there in those conditions, photographing, coming back with these pictures. Yeah, well, Lindsay's just put a question through. He said, uh, keep going, you're a, you're, you're, you are a survivor. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've managed for a few years. Yeah, well, we both have, mate. <laughs> yeah, Conic and Minolta. Now, Bacardi, this is an interesting story. Bacardi, I think, has competed in 29 Hobarts, more than any other boat. And I was talking, is it Martin Power? I was talking to him in Hobart about that red and white spinnaker, and he said, that bloody spinnaker, we've had that for all 29. <laughs> and I said, must 
be made out of pretty good stuff. This is my favourite location, really. Just while you're on that, how many races did um, Benetto do? He did a hell of a Johnny Benetto from Tasmania. I don't know the answer to that. No, uh, he did a few, though, but I'm, I, th I still think she's got the record, but he must have been oh. far behind her. Yeah, could be. So this, this book, this book is quite large. It's 420 millimetres square and it weighs 6.7 kilograms. Wow. Quetzalcoatl from 2009 which, was late afternoon and um, sea mist down over the cliffs, late afternoon sun, and then I get this beautiful colour. Mm. What more could you want? What more could you want? And we've got Investec Loyal here, which has raised a lot of money for charity. I think if I look at the caption, for the Loyal Foundation, they've ra they raised $5 million. Wow. Yeah, I think Sean Langman was the man on board and skipper. Mike, uh, Richard, Mike uh, O'Reilly's asked a question. Which, uh, Richard, would you ever shoot images from a chopper? Ah, since 2014, I've been shooting from a chopper. Right. And I love it. Now that I'm in my mid-70s, I'm in business class now. A <laughs> lot of twisting and turning, lying in the back of a 172 on the floor, doing steep turns. It, it takes a lot, a lot of energy and... Um, Agility, hmm. and uh, my agility is declining. So now I shoot from a Jet Ranger, and uh, I'm really enjoying the experience. I charter it for the duration; it's at my disposal, and I put fuel down on the Tasman Peninsula, and we go off for the day, and we're there the whole time. And it's it's a great great platform, and it's improved the detail I can achieve in the photographs because um, I can travel very, very slowly. I don't like to hover because I don't want to cause any wash. And the aircraft is smoother when it's actually moving. And I now have a 50 megapixel camera, which means, as you'll see in a minute, the detail that we get with 50 megapixels is is quite extraordinary. Yeah. This is um, on the left spirit of Down Under on, at, at Southwest Cape, one of the great capes of the Southern Hemisphere, and, and Wild Oats 11, who's, um, she, I think she was a seven times Lion Honours winner and uh, probably the most successful maxi to compete in the Sydney Hobart. Just to confirm one thing, Lindsay, Lindsay Mays come through and he said uh, he was on Love and War in 2004 and 2006, but not 74 and 1978. So right. twice, 2004 and 2006. Yeah. And uh, Matt Allen's Itchy Balm 70 footer. Mm. I love the, there's a Southern Ocean feel about the picture. The sea's different off the New South Wales coast and even in Bass Strait. And um, it's a much colder look down here in Tassie. And the colour palette is different too. Yeah. Richard, one question, and that is, um, I've, I've talked to other photographers, you know, like the um, um, Rolex guys, and... and one of the things that, that stands out to them from um, your work, and that is that you print all your own stuff and the quality of your paper and your printing and, and um, you know, everything connected with your, with your photos is, is uh, you know, absolutely A1. Can you maybe just tell us a little bit about you know, that expertise? Because you've obviously got it. Well, a press photographer 
is uh, shooting for print. They produce a file that's published in the media and they generally shoot with longer lenses and get in really close and they're shooting what I'd refer to as news pictures. That's right. what they do and that's what I'd do if I was doing what they do. But I'm a pictorial photographer. I'm doing stuff that satisfies me. And the greatest satisfaction to me is making a beautiful, fine art print. So I've spent a lot of time studying and doing courses and buying the best printers, using the best pigment inks and the best 100% cotton rag archival papers. And what I want to do is make the most beautiful print that I possibly can that's going to last for generations. And if you've got a digital file, say on your phone or on a CD or on a, on a, a floppy disk, technology changes and it might be gone. You mightn't be able to ever retrieve it. You might lose it. You mightn't even be able to find any way to print it. But once you've got a paper print that's archival, it's there for generations. Remember, Kodak said, you press the button and we'll take the rest. We'll do the rest. And with his box brown, the box brown, they produce these little archival black and white prints that are still here in 100 years. And that's what I'm trying to do with this book. I'm trying to make that record that'll document the race in a pictorial way and be here for a very long time. That's what gives me pleasure. Okay, 2013 Karamba. She was on the right, described as a Benetton on steroids. I love the Silver Sea, it's a bit like Looks a bit like liquid mercury to me. Mm. And celestial on the right, the same thing. So it's pictorial as well as action. And if you look at Yeah Baby um, on the left, when there's not much wind, like there's not here, I'm going for the warmth and the morning light. And um, I lighten the crew and uh, I bring out the, the waves and the highlights in the sea and I sharpen the sails to put the texture in the sails, slightly darken the edges uh, of the image. And I just try to make a beautiful print. I wouldn't want to be doing anything else. This is, um, again, this is Bacardi again. She got in the book twice, Bacardi did. I think this was um, 2014. Hobart Airport was closed that day for quite a while because of 50 knots across the runway. Mm. And um, we needed to go back to refuel and Ralph and I had a discussion. If we went back and landed, they wouldn't let us take off again. So we pulled up in a paddock for a couple of hours till they reopened the airport and then we went back and refueled and came out again. So we're getting pretty close. I've got the iron pot there in uh, one image with uh, Pretty Fly. And here is um, Comanche. I was um, amazed by that long, skinny mast mm. and the technology that holds all of that gear up there and the power and the strength that hold it there. Richard, I've got one question from Mark. Yeah. Um, and he says, wonderful images, Richard. You just mentioned moving to a 50 millibyte camera. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little about your digital workflow, please, such as 
process in, in Lightroom and, and how you deliver such outstanding results. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. I shoot with a 50 megapixel Canon camera. Uh, I shoot with two cards in the camera so that I've got the same image on both cards. I then um, uh, put that image on a hard drive. I send one card to my laboratory who make a proof to put on the dock overnight. When I get home and I want to make a print from that file, I put that file into Photoshop uh, the raw file, I adjust it for a black point and I adjust the highlights for a white point to make sure I've got blacks in the image and whites in the image. I then adjust the shadow detail to maximise the shadows. I then look at the highlight detail and take the highlights down until I have detail in the highlights. I then crop my image and um, I make a black and white internegative of that image and um, I invert that black and white and I blur it and then um, I overlay that with the colour image to put a luminosity into the shot. It's like a highlight behind the image to bring out the light and make it snap. Um, I, I adjust um, the, um, the um, saturation of the colour so that it's not too saturated. If the file has water that looks too blue, I take the blue back to what do I think looks real and uh, I apply local sharpening to the parts of the image that I want to sharpen and only sharpen some of it. I have my printer calibrated. I have a guy come over from Melbourne who writes a profile for every colour paper that I use and I apply that profile to the paper and, and then I select the paper that suits the image and I print it um, on a Canon uh, ProGraph 1000 printer using their archival Lucia inks. And I generally print it on an Ilford 100% cotton rag um, textured matte paper. Does, does that answer the, the question? I think so. <laughs> Good. And on the right, we've got Balance, who I think Paul Clitheroe, he was the outright winner in uh, 2015, but uh, this was shot in 2016, and half the boats didn't even see Tasmania because of this low cloud and rain that persisted the whole, the whole time. I'm only going to keep you a few minutes more because I'm on a, on a timetable. You are, mate, you're doing well. 50 megapixel camera. This was Wild Oats in uh, 2017. Wow. She, she lost her line on his victory uh, following a protest that happened just a few minutes after the start. Yes, I remember that well. <laughs> yeah. And the wizard. Well, I was getting in close doing what sports photographers do, as you mentioned it. But I don't like to get in that close. I prefer to shoot wider. Bo Jest. I remember it was getting late in the day. And my pilot said to me, he said, hey, we got to go. And I said, I need to look at that sunset. There's a bit of breeze. I look at Bojest, I've got to do that. He said, if we don't go now, we're not going to get back to Hobart tonight. I said, I need to shoot the boat. He said, well, we're going to have to land in a paddock down here. I said, okay. So we stayed out and did the shot. 
And then we did three or four more boats and he said, we've got to go now or we're not even going to make it to the paddock. So we went, we got back into the paddock with lights at 9.20 at night, got a car and drove back to Hobart. I finished work at 12.30 at night. Pilot drove back down and refueled the aircraft. I went back to the airport three hours later and came back to start another day, all to get this picture of Bo Jest in the late evening. 3,200 ISO. It's, it's really pushing the boundaries of what's achievable with um, photographic technology. But we're so fortunate to have such great tools to work with. And here's um, Sean Langman's Maluka yeah. of Kamandi. He goes from the biggest boat in the fleet to the smallest. Very capable. Yachtsman and a good bloke. Yeah, I love that. We're nearly there. And Tasman Passage again, one of my favourite uh, spots. And uh, I kept the last few pages in the book for the latest Sydney Hobart, just finished. And here are the pictures that I selected for this year. We've got a live that won it the previous year. Not a lot of wind. And Lexi, flying down through Storm Bay and there were dolphins everywhere. Mm. And uh, the northeaster had pushed this mist and cloud down over the blade on the, the peninsula and Lexi came around the corner and I went back with a long lens, framed my shot and I waited for the dolphins and there's the, can you see the dolphin yeah, yeah, there? Yeah. What a great shot. Yeah, I really liked it. I think the crew liked it too. I bet they did. Yeah. So we've got about four more pictures to look at and we're done. No, uh, well done. Here's um, dark and stormy and how appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. I love the late evening light out there. It's a beautiful, beautiful part of the world. And Cinquant. Approaching the, the pot and heading into the unknown fickle realms of the Derwent estuary. And Wild Rose, an ex Admiral's Cup boat, restored for this Sydney Hobart, I believe, and now residing in the Tamer River. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And um, my daughter came out with me that day and we landed on Tasman Island and she took this photograph of her tired old father <laughs> taking refuge in uh, one of the houses up by the lighthouse there. I do right. get a bit tired at times after by the end of it all. Yeah, I bet you are. That's it. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, this is from Robert Longbottom. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Richard and RSYS for a very amazing pictorial archive of the recent past of the Sydney Hobart Yacht Race. And then Mike O'Reilly says, thank you, Richard. Thanks to the, the RSYS. And Lindsay May says, thank you, Richard. An absolute pro. Could, couldn't agree more. Uh, Michael McLean, how can we purchase the book? Ah, here's your big go, Richard. Well, the book you can purchase on my website. Um, you go onto my website, richardbennett.com.au um, and... and um, just press search 
and you'll find the book there and you can turn the pages and look at the book and you can purchase it online. Or you can phone me directly and we can do it that way. Uh, David Watson says, uh, congratulations, Richard. Fabulous stuff. Good on you, Goolie. <laughs> what I, it's one of, one of my mates. <laughs> um, uh, no, we've done that one. No, that's it. So are there any other questions? Because, uh, you know, time's sort of marching on a bit. So um, if there are no other questions, uh, I might ask Karen if she could uh, uh, give you a thank you. Yeah, um, I actually do think, Richard, you've answered the questions that we had that came through beforehand on, you know, what sort of camera you were using. And you used a, a range of lenses out there? Um, I use a um, 70 to 200 millimetre Canon zoom lens, um, a fast lens f2.8. And it, I usually shoot at a focal length of around 100 millimetres. I don't like to shoot too wide. I don't want to get close. And I find that gives me a perspective that suits my work. No, well, it's certainly, it's been absolutely spectacular to, to work our way through the book. And uh, we'll email out to everybody your um, uh, website address just so they don't forget. Um, but it's pretty easy, richardbennett.com.au. And really, I'd just like to, to thank you and your daughter, Claire, for helping us get this together. And thanks also, Bruce, for joining us. But um, it has been absolutely spectacular. Um, I think I'm not sure if I'm ready to go offshore sailing yet. But um, it, it, um, the, the photographs are, are breathtaking and um, you really do capture the elements. And uh, thank you so much for sharing with our audience tonight. It's been fantastic to work your, our way through your book. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Bruce. And thank you to, to all. Um, and please do come and visit us when you're up in Sydney next. Um, we would love to see you at the squadron. Thank you. If you come up, Richard, I'll take your sailing on Margaret Winter here. Oh, I'd like that, Bruce. Wonderful. Okay. And thanks everybody for joining us. We've got uh, lots of thank yous coming in here. Absolute Bonza presentation. Uh, cheers, Doug and Chris. Uh, yeah, lots of thank yous coming in. So uh, thanks so much, Richard and, and Bruce, and thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, guys.